yeah, this is this is powder. I'm, you know, it's my very first time, you know, actually running a story over here on uh, Paradigm Media News. I've been, you know, hustling on my own channel, Powder's Prison Channel, doing all kinds of crazy things over there, trying to uh, screen the best of the best. And I developed this relationship with uh, this, this channel right here, and obviously a lot of people have been following my my story, so I'm going to take this one. This one's going to go all the way back to the very basics. This is the, the very first time when I was putting my hands on a 357 Magnum. You know, everybody comes from different backgrounds. Everybody comes from different walks of life, whether you're Hispanic, whether you're black, whether you're Norteño, Sudeño, it doesn't, it doesn't matter what it is. We all have this, this past and this childhood that we, we grow up into, and we develop these, these crazy things based on our childhood. And I grew up Anybody who's seen part one of I've Seen a Monster or part two of I've Seen a Monster of my story over on Powder's Prison Channel will understand of the violence in my household and the violence that I dealt with at a very early age. So with that comes violent behavior. That's, that's what I was taught. I was taught violence at an early age. So off the top, I'm going to be a violent person. And, you know, I've talked about how I got jumped in this, you know, a youth crew. Before I became P9 Death Squad, I was involved in this little neighborhood crew out there in Lakeland Village, Southern California, Lake Elsinore, surrounded by Temecula, Menifee, Paris, Riverside. Those who don't know out here in Southern California, it, it has its own unique style, has its own unique way of doing things. Well, back around this time, you know, things were crazy. These days, you can not get caught doing anything, barely. But back then, you can walk down the street with a pistol in your hand, and no one's going to call the cops. So... Knowing that, knowing that, we think we can get away with everything. So when I was 16 years old, I was at this house party. I went to this house party, and it was ran by my homeboy, Chief, who is now deceased. And I will probably end up getting on this, this channel and running that story of how he got murdered. And the way that he got murdered was a big deal out in Lake Elsinore. He was a big deal out in Lake Elsinore. And this, this story, it's, it's real special to me because this was a pivoting moment in my life. This, is, this was setting precedence in the direction of my lifestyle. So, you know, I've been running around with this whole little SM crew. I've been running around with them the way I was introduced to them. I was just getting introduced to this street gang lifestyle. So when I was hanging out with them, I was starting to become really good friends with a lot of these dudes, and I ended up moving into this neighborhood, so on and so forth. And then there was a party that was being thrown in a little town right outside of um, Lake Elsinore called um, Bromoland. It was in a house called Bromoland, and one of my older homeboys' homegirls owned that little house. And it was a little two bedroom mobile homes right out in the outskirts in the middle of nowhere so you could be as loud as you want you can fire off gunshots you can have bonfires and and pretty much just do whatever you can run wild and no one's going to call the cops it's out in the middle of the nowhere and that was the purpose of having this party out there in the middle of nowhere i just had no idea of what was really going on i was just hanging out with these boys trying to prove myself because i was i just wanted to be accepted you know, when you come from these crazy lifestyles, you, you, you have these acceptance issues because you didn't get the love and you didn't get the support when you were a kid, so you're looking for it from anywhere. So I was getting this love and, and this support from this little neighborhood game called Sick Minded White Boys. So Sick Minded White Boys, we're out there now. Now they're throwing this little party out there in Roma Land, and we all load up. It's like, it's like 5 o'clock, about, about ready to get dark, sun's about to go down, and I go pick up two of my homegirls, Brianna and Eleanor. And I used to drive a truck. I had my own license. I was doing fairly good for myself, but I was still starting to spiral downhill, and I went to that house party. We went to this house party when I picked up my homegirls, and we showed up there. When we arrived, there was all kinds of SMs there that I had never met. They were already membership. They were already sick-minded membership. There's a big difference between association and membership. And later on down the line, I'll explain the big difference between being tipped up, membership, association, and all that type of stuff. So when I showed up there, there was just all kinds of white boys. There was about 50 white boys in slingshots. It's summertime, and these dudes are just looking grimy. The sick-minded white boys, Lakeland Village, it's a grimy place to live, so it's going to produce grimy people. It's just all we know. We're out there smoking crack. We're underage. We're drinking. We're doing things that we're not supposed to be doing. And I showed up there with my older cousin, Mike, Mike Novak. Mike Novak was one year older than me, and he was the one who kind of got me affiliated with all this type of stuff. So, boom, when we show up, 
I step outside of my truck and I introduce these girls to my best friend, Sly, Josh Gibbs. Josh Gibbs was the reason who I got into to SM. He's the one who prospected me. He's the one that was getting me familiar with this whole this whole lifestyle. And I looked up to him. I idolized him. He was a straight stud. Like, bro, he was a straight stud, and, and a lot of people idolized him, and a lot of people looked up to him because he didn't back down from nobody. So um, he's introducing me and all my homegirls to everybody right there in the neighborhood, and I'm not even recognizing what's going on. This is a ritual of when people get jumped in. This is a ritual that goes on in sick-minded that goes on when you're about to get jumped in, but I had no knowledge of this. I was just thinking I'm hitting another house party, and we're hanging out. And this is, this, is, this is a very serious situation because you just never know how these things are going to play out. And this is going to lead up into a very serious situation as well. So we're all hanging out inside the house. We're inside the house and we're all drinking and Chief shows up. Chief is the main dude from Sick Minded from the Elsinore chapter, not the Riverside chapter, from the Lake Elsinore chapter. And he's inside there. And this was like one of the first times I really met him. And, you know, when you're, in, when you're getting involved in gangs, there's, there's a lot of serious dudes, and especially the ones that are in decision-making um, positions, they're making very serious decisions, so they're very serious people. So they portray themselves as the baddest of the baddest. And I used to look up to all these dudes, and this SM was the baddest white boy gang in Lake Elsinore at this time, hands down. So we're hanging out in there, and all of a sudden, my older homeboy, Fat Steve, tells everybody, hey, Get outside of the house. Everybody's got to get outside of the house right now. Everybody get out now. Everybody's got to leave the house. And he was like in a panic, and it kind of startled me. It startled me. It startled everybody. It startled the girls. It startled everybody. So we just start rushing outside out to the lot. Now we're all hanging out, and I'm like in confusion. I'm in confusion, and I'm looking around, and I'm like, what, what is going on? And I'm asking people. I'm asking the homeboys around me, like, what is going on? What is everybody tripping on? Why do we all have to go outside of the mobile home? And then my homeboy, Fat Steve, he pokes me on the shoulder, and I look at him, and he dope fiends me, and he hits me as hard as he could right in the nose. Boom. And I fall down on my back. When I fall down on my back, I'm getting just hit and kicked all over my face and my head, and it wasn't processing to me that I'm being jumped. I'm being jumped. And I'm like, in my mind as I'm being kicked in the face, and I'm not being kicked in the face lightly, I'm being kicked in the face as hard as these dudes could. And there was at least 10 dudes that were kicking me and punching me in the face, and I'm trying to make my way up, and I just couldn't seem to make my way up, and finally I did. I muscled my way up, and then I got cracked again. And then they dropped me again, and they started kicking me again, and then I popped up one more time, and they were trying to give me hugs. They were trying to give me hugs like, you're in, bro. You're in, bro. And that's when it dawned on me. That's when it all registered and it clicked. But I just got jumped in. I just got jumped in. and like, bro, you're, you're one of us, bro. You're one of us, Powder. And I was like, bro. Like, and I was, my adrenaline was going so fast. You know, that was my very first time being jumped. That was my very first time, obviously, being jumped into a gang. And this whole barbecue and this whole house party was lined up specifically for me. It was a ritual that, hey, we're going to jump powder in. It's time. He's prospected long enough. He's hung out with us enough. He's done enough dirt. Now it's time to make him membership. And what happens after you get jumped in, there's two homegirls named Sabra and Tootsie, and they grab you. And they tell you, all the homeboys say, hey, Tootsie and Sabra, take him in. Clean him up. Because I was so bloody. I mean, I got kicked in the face at least 15 to 20 times, and, and my nose was broken. I eventually I had black eyes, busted lips, like they, 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 they come aggressive because it's an aggressive gang and they want to see if you're able to take it and they want to see what your reaction is going to be. So I went in with my two homegirls. I went in with my two homegirls and a couple of the homeboys were in the back room loading up a Polaroid camera. Back then, this, there was, we weren't taking pictures with cell phones. We were taking pictures with Polaroid cameras. So I sit there with my two homegirls and they grab a gray bandana. After they washed my face up, my, my, my slingshots ripped up off me, and they cleaned me up, and they say, Powder, all, all the blood's off your face. Come on, you've got to go to the living room. You've got to take a picture with us. And I'm like, take a picture with you? All right, come on, let's go. So I go into the middle of the room, and I'm like, well, and they grab me by the hand. They're like, come on, and now they're being very gentle, and they're showing me a lot of affection because I just, that's what happens. Once you're jumped in, now you're loved. You get that homeboy love. You get that sick-minded love. And, and they tear the rest of my slingshot off me. They tear it off me because it was already ripped from, from them grabbing me and punching me. And they say, hey, put, put your arms around me. 
They say, put your arms around me. We're going to take three photos. We're going to take one of us on each side of you with your arms wrapped around us. Then you're going to take two of them throwing up SM. Two of them. They want two of them. I get to take a copy, and one stays for the house. I was like, wow, this is, this is how it is, huh? And there's only one person that takes the photo, and that's Chief. So Chief comes out, and I'm like, wow, I got the privilege in honor of, like, getting, getting a picture taken by my homeboy Chief. So Tootsie gets on one side, and Saber gets on the other, and I put my arms around them, and they snap a photo. Boom. Then after they snap a photo, those girls leave. They step out of the photo. Now they're taking Polaroid number two, and they hand me the gray bandana. They say, take that gray bandana and throw it over your shoulder, and I threw it over my shoulder, and they snapped the second photo. Then they took the, then they took the gray, gray bandana, and they put it in, the, in my waistline in the back, and they said, throw up SM, and they showed me how to do and throw up SM with my fingers in the shape and the form of an S with my right hand and the M with my left hand. So I threw it up, and they snapped out Polaroid. Boom, official membership of SM. Now I am an officially a member. This is a ritual that they've been having since Riverside. SM started in Riverside, and it was started by one of my older homeboys named Miser and Danny Curran. Danny Curran was one of the original founders of Sick Minded out there in Riverside. And then it ended up eventually spreading out to Lake Elsinore, to which Shane McLaughlin, rest in peace, chief, so then now I'm officially membership, and now there's some things going on. I'm hanging out. We're smoking. We're getting a, a lot more intoxicated. I mean, highly intoxicated. And then they say, hey, one of my homegirls says, hey, Powder, they want to talk to you in the back room. I said, who wants to talk to me in the back room? And they say, Chief wants to talk to you in the back room. And Chief's a very serious person, and I'm like, all right, bro, like, all right, okay, cool. What does he want to talk to me about? I just got jumped in what could this possibly be and I make my way to the back room and I don't know which back room I'm really looking for and he says over here bro over here and I and I see him I see him over on the bed and I walk into the room and they say shut the door bro and lock it I'm like shut the door and lock it all right bro I'm gonna shut the door and lock it so I shut the door and I lock the door and I sit down and he says sit next to me and it's me chief and my homeboy Sly, Josh Gibbs, and we're sitting there on the bed, and I see them pull out a crack pipe. This was my very first time taking my, my hit of crack. And they pull out one crack pipe, and Chief pulls out a humongous big old ball of crack cocaine. It was orange, and I've never tried it. And I looked at that, and I said, bro, what is that? And they said, bro, it's crack. It's crack cocaine. You're going to smoke it with us. And the reason why that they do this is they want to see if you – are going to actually take a hit of it. Once you take a hit of it, they know that you're not some sellout. They don't think you're a pussy or anything like that. And, you know, on the path that I'm going, I'm trying to be the most violent. I'm trying to be the baddest person I can possibly be. And the purpose of this story right here is because, so they hand me the crack rock. They load it up. And he didn't load up some little tiny crack rock. It was just, it was a big crack rock. And he puts it inside the crack pipe. And he says, here, powder, take a hit. Take a hit. And as I grab the crack pipe and I grab the rock, I take a fat hit. I take the biggest hit as I could possibly take because I didn't want to look like no um, weak. I didn't want to show weakness in front of the eyes of these guys. I wanted to let them see that I was serious about everything. And I take a big old hit. And as I'm taking a hit and blowing it out, all of a sudden there's a knock on the door. Boom, 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 boom inside the room. There's a knock. Boom, 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 boom. And it's like kind of like frantic. And he walks inside the room. And Chief asks, who is it? Who is it? And he says, it's Fat Steve. Open the door, open the door. It's Fat Steve. Open the door. So he says, hey, Fly, go open the door for him. So he goes and he opens the door. He unlocks the door. He lets Fat Steve in. He closes the door. And Chief says, make sure you guys lock the door, dude. So we lock the door. Now it's me, Chief, Gibbs, Fat Steve. It's us four. We're in there. I cast the crack rock to Josh Gibbs. I pass it to Fly, and he takes a hit. And, I, and then he's doing his thing, and he's going to pass it to the Chief so on and so forth. As this is going on, all of a sudden, Fat Steve, he says, hey, check this out. I know where they're kicking it at. He's telling Chief, I know where they're kicking it at. And he's referring to EYC, Elsinore Young Classics. Out there where I'm from in Southern California, Lake, Lake Elsinore, at this time, this was around like 2000. And around 2000, it was the worst. It was at its peak as far as crime, murders, attempted murders, and all that. 
Elsinore Young Classics was the new gang out there in Elsinore that was running deep. They were like literally demons on earth, demons on earth, and they are trying to take over the lake. They want to claim the lake as them. They are hardcore Sureños, and they are strapped to the core, and they're committing murders. They're doing everything they can possibly do. They will kick down your door and murder your whole family type of people, and I'm not even saying that as an exaggeration of the truth. That's facts. And that's what was going on here. And I know in every state they have their own little killings and gangs and structures and forms. Out here in California, it's just a little bit different. It's just a little bit more serious. And at this time, these, these Hispanic gang members were so crazy. And when you see the look in their eyes, you know that they're not playing. They're not playing. So Fat Steve's telling, hey, I know where they're kicking it at. And she says, where are they at? And they say he's over off Stallman Street. Stallman Street in Elsinore is an EYC street, and they own that entire street right there, and they're having a house party that night. That night they're having a house party. And she says, who's all out there? He said, they're all over there. And it's at an individual named Payaso's house. Payaso from EYC was one of the main dudes at that time, and he used to roll around in a cutlass. A cutlass supreme spun out, cocaine out, Friday, Saturday, Sunday nights, it didn't matter. They're cruising and patrolling the streets. And at this time, we were rivaling. But SM has never pulled a stunt like what's about to happen until this time. Until this time, we became, this is, they, they, they never pulled an act like this. So, so Chief looks at me and he grabs a big old 357 Magnum Cobra from underneath the bed. And it's a box of hollow point bullets. And it's a rubber grip handle all nickel plated. I've never even put my hands on a gun like that in my life. I never put my hands on a pistol like that in my life. I'm like 16 years old at this time. Chief is about 20 years old. And these dudes are all older than me. They're all 20, 21, and 22. I'm about 16. I'm officially membership. And Chief asked me right then and there, listen, I just said, hey, Powder, you down or what? And I say, hell yeah, I'm down, bro. What's up? What are we doing? And he said, bro, look, this is what's going to happen, bro. You got a truck, right? I said, yeah, I got a truck. He said, bro, check this out. Fat Steve is going to drive your truck down there. You're going to ride passengers. You're going to load this thing up, and you're going to drive down Stoneman. You're going to turn around on the cul-de-sac, and on your way out, you're going to hop out of that passenger seat, and you're going to fire every freaking bullet out of that gun, and you're going to hit as many of them EYCs out there standing on the lawn as possible. We good? I said, bro, let's do this, bro. Like, load it up, bro. Load it up, bro. We're going to handle this, bro. It's going to happen. So... That's what's up. That is the plan. So now we're putting this plan into effect. We're putting this plan into effect, and basically I said, all right, so I get with Fat Steve. Now the party's over. The party's over. Chief is sending everybody home. We're telling everybody to go home. I got my homegirl, Brianna and Eleanor, with me. I'm responsible for them. I'm going to go drop them off. So I tell Brianna and Dodie, I tell Brianna and Eleanor, Get inside my truck. It's time to go home. I'm taking you home. And they're panicking. They're like, what for? I said, I got to go handle business. And they knew right then and there something was going to happen. And I said, don't worry about it. Don't worry about me. I got this. She started, they started crying. Literally started crying as I'm driving them home. And I said, look, don't worry about it. I dismissed their tears. I dismissed everything. And I dropped them off at their house. And I came back. And it was me, Fat Steve, and Gary. Gary Schmidley, who just passed away. He just passed away recently, so rest in peace, Gary. They used to call him Ozark. And I asked Fat Steve before we leave, I say, bro, do you got a license? He says, yes, I got a license. I said, all right, bro, let's go. So it's Fat Steve driving my truck, Ozar's in the middle, and I'm in the passenger seat, and we're on our way out. We're on our way to do this. I got my finger on the trigger. I'm ready to roll. The 357's on my lap. It's fully loaded, and we're on our way. We're on our way through there, and we hit Canyon Lake at a stop sign, and there's a cop right there. And Steve starts panicking, and the cop is right behind us, and he blurts us and pulls us over.